Hello everyone, my name is Dr Peter McCauley and I'm a lecturer in psychology at the University of Derby and I'm going to be presenting a paper to you today on promoting junior school students anti-bullying beliefs with the CATS cross-age teaching zone intervention that I've been working with Dr Mike Bolton at the University of Chester. So bullying is a serious public health concern and it is imperative effective anti-bullying interventions are put in place to address the issue. So while progress has been made in implementing interventions to tackle bullying, meta-analyses reveal residual rates that are usually far from zero. However, meta-analyses and systematic reviews on anti-bullying intervention strategies in general report some positive outcomes for anti-bullying prevention efforts, reducing bullying victimisation and perpetration. So, for example, Gaffney et al. in 2019 found their meta-analysis on the effectiveness of school bullying prevention programmes that there was a reduction of victimisation by 8-12% from evaluations conducted in the UK, with positive outcomes at reducing victimisation and perpetration globally. Despite this, however, anti-bullying interventions have not always been regarded as effective. One reason might be because students are not always receptive to anti-bullying initiatives delivered by teacher and other adults. Rigby and Bradshaw and Bolton and Bolton in 2012 <clears throat> reports that many students believe teachers are not usually interested in tackle bullying and express little or no desire to collaborate with them on this regard. More recently, qualitative focus groups of young people suggested that anti-bullying interventions did not engage students, were delivered in a repetitive manner and students felt that teachers were not the best group to deliver these anti-bullying messages. And this is where our work on CATS comes in. So looking at cooperative group work, cooperative group work has been shown to assist in students learning in academic and social behavioural domains, including anti-bullying. And similarly, cross-age teaching approaches have been shown to benefit tutors' academic development and social behavioural development. So given these positive but separate results for cooperative group work and cross-age teaching across such a wide variety of domains and variables, Dr Mike Bolton at the University of Chester developed an approach that combined them to target social outcomes, referred to here as the cross-age teaching zone, and we have been considering if it can be used to promote anti-bullying beliefs among students. And there are good theoretical and empirical reasons why a focus on the effect of CATS on tutors rather than tutees is appropriate. So working with the lesson content, that facilitates cognitive restructuring and elaboration as it is incorporated into existing schemas, which suggests that CATS provides opportunities for learning as tutors work with the lesson content, make lin links with the knowledge they already hold, and go on to develop more advanced cognitive structures and schemas. So applying for Gottsky's social cultural theory, the scaffolding of this type of learning provided by the adult facilitators of CATS interventions and the fact that tutors were required to rework the lesson content into a viable lesson means tutors are in the zone of proximal development, that is, just outside what they can do or know unaided. So in our case, that means CATS tutors will likely be thinking about bullying in novel ways, and the fact that CATS tutors are working cooperatively to develop and deliver their lesson further optimises the likelihood that they will learn the lesson content. And looking at role theory here as well. Role theory also suggests that acting as a teacher promotes that feeling of responsibility even more because it en engenders a sense of care towards tutees. So our primary aim, therefore, was to conduct three linked studies that examine the effect of CATS on beliefs that one, non-physical forms of bullying are unacceptable, which is study one, Two, disclosing bullying to adults and getting the right kind of help have value and importance, which is study two. And three, victims can be insisted in safe ways, which is study three. Each intervention was delivered by different researchers in semi-autonomous ways. And given that the magnitude of positive effects of interventions delivered by their creators in one context are often attenuated when they are delivered by other people in another context, this would allow us to assess the likelihood that CATS could be rolled out more widely by diverse groups of facilitators. So related to the above, our second aim was to test if the effect of CATS differed as a function of gender. And finally, our third aim, also relevant to the implications of our findings for anti-bullying practice, we assessed the social validity of CATS by examining how acceptable it was to participants. So simply put, to be optimally effective student-led intervention, it has to be well received by students themselves. So looking at the method for study one, 
99 participants took part, 55 in the CATS group and 44 acted as business as usual controls, continuing with their normal lessons. The four dependent variables were beliefs about non-physical forms of bullying, specifically harmful exclusion measured with the, the closed question, how harmful do you think social exclusion is? Harmful verbal measured with the closed question, how harmful do you think verbal bullying is? Acceptable exclusion measured with the closed question, how acceptable do you think social exclusion is? And acceptable verbal measured with the closed question, how acceptable do you think verbal bullying is? Each of these four questions had a five point response option, initially anchored with not at all and a lot. So looking at the method for study two, this study involved 197 participants, 106 in the CATS group and 91 business as usual controls, continuing with their normal lessons. The two dependent variables were beliefs concerning getting help when one is bullied, specifically when to tell, measured with the open question, if you were bullied, how would you know when it would be a good idea to tell the teacher? And wanted help, measured with the open question, if you had been bullied and told a teacher, what could you do um, to make sure you get the right kind of help. And for each open question, a researcher developed a coding scheme to identify common categories of responses, and two independent raters then used it to code all of the responses collated. And there was high levels of intercoder agreement, um, Cohen's Kappa 0.89. Now looking at the method for study three, uh, there were 123 participants in study three, 76 of which were in the CATS group and 47 of which were in the control group. Unlike in studies one and two, researchers delivered a 40 minute presentation to control participants focused on the material that CATS participants had been asked to include in their lesson. So, for example, the CATS learning content. Now, this allowed us to examine the effectiveness of CATS against a form of direct instruction, something that is deemed another appropriate way alongside a business as usual control group to test an educational intervention. The three dependent variables were beliefs about supporting victims, specifically victim support, emotional, victim support, address bully and victim support, other. Now, the three dependent variables were derived from three open questions. If you saw another child being bullied, what would you do? How could you try to stop a bully being nasty to someone without making them pick on you? And finally, how could you help someone if they were bullied? The coding process was very similar to that employed in study two, and the number of desirable and appropriate responses across these three questions were tallied for each dependent variable. So looking at the procedure across studies one to three, so facilitators could encourage buy-in by explaining to CATS tutors that taking part was voluntary, they could stop at any time and rejoin without giving a reason, and they were being invited to work in small groups of about five students to design a roughly 30-minute anti-bullying lesson and deliver it to a small group of students who were two years younger than themselves. So tutors were informed that facilitators would provide them with the required lesson content, offer suggestions about how to plan, um, test and deliver a lesson on it, but that the details would be left to them and they could augment that content however they see fit. Facilitators aim to strike a balance between being suitably supportive on the one hand and leaving tutors to take ownership of their lesson on the other. While the final decision of the lesson itself was left to each group of the tutors, facilitators ensured that at a minimum they all designed a poster that contained the lesson content and prepared a script of what was to be said and done by each group member during the lesson. And across the three studies, CATS tutors received similar guidance from facilitators and had similar time, about four 60 minute sessions, which was used to prepare their lesson spread over two to three weeks. Then within a few days, they delivered their lesson and facilitators and class teachers observed these, but did take no active role um, within this process. So looking at the results then, specifically the effects of CATS on individual measures. So the condition by time by gender interaction was non-significant for all nine outcome variables, indicating that gender did not moderate any effects of CATS. Hence, gender did not feature in any of the results we now go on to report concerning these nine outcome variables. For all outcome measures, the condition by time interaction was significant. So using Cohen's scheme, partial letters squared were low, less than 0.06 for acceptable exclusion, medium between 0.06 to 0.138 on four measures, 
which were harmful exclusion, victim support emotional, victim support address bully, victim support other, and high greater than 0.138 on four measures, which were harmful verbal, acceptable verbal, wanted help, and when to tell. And now looking at the results across time comparisons, with only one exception involving acceptable exclusion at time two, CATS participants had significantly more desirable scores than controls at time two, and at time three on all variables. On none of the nine measures did control participants evidence a significant change in a positive direction from time one to time two, or from time one to time three. But this was the case for all measures among the CATS groups as you can see in this table. On the, two, on the two study two measures with follow up data, which was wanted how and when to tell, time three scores were significantly less desirable than at time two among CATS participants. So just summarising some of the key aspects of our results then, with very few exceptions, results indicated CATS did have a positive effect. So CATS participants showed significant improvements from time one to time two on all measures where controls did not change for the better on any measure. On the two measures with follow-up data in study two, which was wanted help and when to tell, the time three scores were significantly more desirable than at time one among CATS participants, but did not change in that direction among controls. So the common language effect size for the nine outcome measures indicated that there was between 62% and 87%, so a mean of 72.4% probability that any randomly selected CATS participants would have more desirable time one to time two change scores than any randomly selected control participant. So summarising this aspect of our finding, the mostly medium or high um, effect size indicates that CATS is likely to have a noteworthy practical benefit for those who experiences. The positive effect of CATS was equally evident among girls and boys. And this is encouraging given that they have been found to score in a less desirable manner on a range of bullying related variables than girls. So for example, boys tend to disclose being bullied less than girls. Um, boys are less likely to intervene in bullying and also boys are less likely to support the victim and often see bully, bullying as less serious compared to girls. So actually this is a, a very positive and encouraging um, finding that the, the effect of cats was equally evident among boys and girls. So after experiencing CATS, a subset of our participants, so 188 participants, were asked to rate it for acceptability and perceived value. And over two thirds had very high scores, eight or above on a one to, one to 10 scale. Again, gender differences were not evident, but this is encouraging that boys are open to girls in engaging in CATS, given that the former tend to be less enthusiastic towards other forms of peer support, broadly defined. Collectively, our findings on the effectiveness and social validity provide strong support for CATS as an anti-bullying intervention targeted at improving beliefs. Schools have many issues to deal with besides bullying and short but effective interventions will likely be taken up more widely. CATS appears to meet this criterion and future studies should explore how schools might incorporate CATS into their wide anti-bullying efforts. Importantly, positive effects of CATS were found across the three studies, each of which were delivered by different facilitators. This is encouraging as for more of a widespread school level implementation of CATS, different teachers will be acting as facilitators for the CATS intervention and providing the learning content for the tutors to rework into a viable lesson to be delivered by younger tutees. So actually the fact that we showed positive effects of CATS across the three studies, each of which were delivered by different facilitators, is a positive finding. So thank you very much. Um, if you have any questions, I'll be in the Q&A session, um, but please feel free to drop me an email at p.macaulay at derby.ac.uk. This paper has been drafted um, and has been submitted to the International Journal of Bullying Prevention, um, but any th feedback or thoughts on the paper would be very much appreciated. Uh, thank you very much and I look forward to networking with you and enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you. Hi, I will be talking about our paper called Examining the Effectiveness of Artificial Intelligence Based Moderation of Cyberbullying on Social Media, which is uh, it's a, a project in, in progress. So it's uh, I still don't have the final findings, but I'll tell you what we have done 
uh, so far and what we know so far. Um, before that, I'm presenting this paper on behalf of myself. I'm Tiana Milosevic. I'm uh, an elite S research fellow at the National Anti-Bullying Research Center, ABC, and ADAPT SFI, both at Dublin City University. And uh, on this uh, paper, I have my joint uh, authors who are participating in this project. That's Kanish Kverma, um, Brian Davis, uh, James O'Higgins Norman, uh, Derek Laffan, uh, and Michael Carter uh, from UC Davis. Um, and this project is um, uh, funded by uh, Facebook's Content Policy uh, Award Grant, uh, Phase Two uh, Research and Social Media Platforms. Um, so. Uh, we are talking about content uh, uh, moderation, um, and um, uh, what do we mean by that? Well, when a child experiences cyberbullying on um, online platforms, be it social media or gaming platforms, um, and if they uh, want to report it, they uh, uh, they report it to the uh, uh, the platform, uh, and it gets reviewed um, by uh, companies' moderators, so humans or by uh, automated processes, which typically rely on artificial intelligence. Um, and then uh, in this process, it is decided whether this content really is cyberbullying and if it should be taken down. And there are two types of this moderation process, reactive, which is when a child reports, and proactive when artificial intelligence-based technology, typically artificial intelligence, but that's uh, natural language processing, machine learning, um, is relied upon uh, to crawl uh, uh, the platform proactively uh, for cyberbullying content. Uh, and when it is detected, the platform then decides if it automatically takes it down or if it sends it for further review, for instance, if they are not sure if it's cyberbullying um, to uh, humans called moderators. Um, and this process is very important because uh, uh, the cyberbullying content ideally should be taken down if nothing else to send the message that such content is not okay and that it should not be allowed on the platforms and to help the bullied child who is experiencing victimization. And so uh, well, companies typically in their transparency reports, uh, uh, larger companies at least like Google, Facebook, Twitter, um, will tell us um, uh, something about this process. Uh, for instance, how much content, cyberbullying content, they were able to action uh, across their, their platforms in a given quarter. Um, and um, they might also uh, uh, tell us something about how effective uh, their tools are at detecting this cyberbullying content. But really our goal in, in this paper was, uh, in, in addition to other things, which I'll get to, was to understand how platforms are approaching this use of artificial intelligence to detect cyberbullying. And once they detect cyberbullying, what do they actually do with this content? How do they go about helping a child when they experience cyberbullying which was detected by artificial intelligence. Um, cyberbullying is very difficult to moderate and uh, 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 most of your bullying and cyberbullying experts, so you will know that cyberbullying is not only constituted of overtly abusive words, which are easier to detect for these automated tools. Um, there can also be subtle and ambiguous linguistic context, irony or sarcasm. For example, the word bitch and cow uh, can be obviously very offensive, but at the same time, if friends are using the, the word bitch in a playful manner, it doesn't necessarily have to be offensive. Uh, so there is a lot of context involved. Uh, cyberbullying can also be exclusion, so excluding someone from a group, and that is a, a very important piece of it, um, and that can be more difficult to detect and not easy to establish if it's really bullying or not by just by using uh, artificial intelligence. Um, the, these systems also have to work across languages and across cultural context. And there's also multimodality, which means that it's not only text, it's also image and video and image, video and text combined. And sometimes it's just the text that is offensive, but the, the image is not and vice versa. And so all of that needs to be taken into consideration. Why is all of this important? Well, um, of course we need to have effective ways uh, to help children uh, in a timely fashion uh, and so that they actually feel supported. Um, and a lot of the regulation that is currently in the process, like the online safety and media regulation bill in Ireland, are establishing um, codes of conduct uh, uh, or will establish codes of conduct for platforms where they will ask for more transparency from social media and gaming platforms and other platforms, direct messaging, on how they're actually doing this. How are they engaging in artificial, with artificial intelligence to actually detect cyberbullying? And then what kinds of mechanisms do they, have, do they have in place when this happens and how effective these are. So we're also informing the policy process with this work. Um, 
sorry. Um, so the key objectives of, of this project really were to map the natural language processing or NLP machine learning and AI based approaches to cyberbullying detection on social media and gaming platforms. So published by independent and industry research, that's what we wanted to know what is the industry telling us um, and what, what are the published papers telling us about this process. Um, we also wanted to map social media companies proactive responses to bullying that rely on NLP, ML and artificial intelligence. So when they actually detect these behaviors, what mechanisms do they have in place? So do they actually need to a human moderator? Do they have uh, a, 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 do they alert the victim? Uh, do they have a, a, a support for the victim? Um, do they engage a bystander? What do they do and what did they tell us? Do they have any of these processes in place? And then we wanted to, based on everything that we found out, we wanted to leverage qualitative research. Uh, so interviews and focus groups with uh, uh, preteen and teen children uh, to uh, solicit their feedback on how effective these interventions are. Do they find them effective or do they not find them effective and why and why not and how can they be improved? Um, and uh, so, so to, to leverage children's feedback to optimize these interventions. Um, so for this first part, we did, we call this the scoping study. We did searches across large databases for automated identification intervention techniques for combating cyberbullying, harassment, and abuse among children on online platforms. So we scoped about 150 research papers, but we found only 17 really research studies that have developed unique data sets for the field of cyberbullying. 24 when you include hate speech, which is very di different from cyberbullying, and when you include racism and other types of abuse, which are sometimes lumped together by computer scientists who are doing this work. So it, there is a great need for interdisciplinary collaboration in this area. And only four data sets actually included classifiers, which are non-binary. So that means um, uh, detection methods, if I can call them crudely that way, uh, that uh, that can actually discriminate whether content is not just abusive or not abusive, but actually whether there is repetition involved or um, uh, they have multiple labels. So they would identify the perpetrator and the victim and the bystander potentially. Uh, and only um, it's a very limited amount of these data sets were actually multimodal, so involving not only texts. Um, and we also had researchers who looked for social media platforms and gaming platforms websites to see what kinds of uh, responses they have to cyberbullying when they detect it in automated ways. So they searched the company's platforms and they did Google searches, I mean, uh, browser searches for, um, uh, for trying to see what is available as published information about what the platforms are actually doing uh, when they use artificial intelligence. What can we know about the, their AI models? and how then the intervention around these models is designed. So I'll just run through the preliminary findings because I wanna focus on the results, preliminary results of the qualitative work as well. So there is a relative lack of interdisciplinary collaboration. So social scientists and computing engineering, ML, AI in this field, um, a relative lack of quality data sets um, and annotation uh, for detecting cyberbullying, insufficient research into multimodal context, um, also insufficient work in the field of multilingual uh, and cultural context, so which is extremely important for cyberbullying detection. And there is only limited information about companies' reliance on AI for such interventions, so limited openness for scrutiny to non-industry researchers. Um, and so this uh, uh, this project was is, is a Facebook funded project was called co-designing with children a rights based uh, approach to fighting bullying. And so what do we mean by rights based framework? Well, uh, according to the UNCRC, which uh, uh, also applies in, in digital environments, in online environments, um, children not only have the right to protection, so to safety from cyberbullying and other harms, but they also have the right to provision and participation, which means that um, uh, we have to strike a balance in our intervention between uh, allowing them to participate and benefit from these environments while also keeping them protected. And um, most importantly, perhaps, uh, according to the UNCRC, children have the right to be heard on matters that concern them, which means that the design of these interventions is something that directly concerns them. So ideally, when platforms design these intervention, interventions, they should solicit children's feedback, or at least we should create research that solicits their feedback 
um, when it comes to this, the design of these cyberbullying interventions, which is what we try to do with this project and is perhaps the most exciting part of it. So we wanted to see in the second qualitative part of our work, how can we design automatic tools that support effective, so that was our first research question, that support effective proactive bullying interventions that assist children while ensuring children's rights to privacy, freedom of expression, and other relevant rights as outlined in the UNCRC. Why does privacy matter here? Well, when you deploy an automated detection system, you're crawling or monitoring the, uh, the platform, including their content, also perhaps in direct messaging for cyberbullying. And that in and of itself has implications for children's privacy. Um, even though a human might not be looking at uh, their, uh, the content that they're sharing uh, privately, at the same time, this content is crawled. And so how do they feel about that? Um, and how do they feel about this balance? For instance, if, if uh, an automated system is deployed to detect cyberbullying, and if cyberbullying content is detected automatically and then taken down, that also has implications for their freedom of expression. So how do they feel about this balance of rights and having sort of um, an intervention that uh, proactively looks for such content? Is this something that they would welcome and why and why not? And how do they feel about this? Um, and the idea is how can we leverage children's feedback to optimize the effectiveness of such tools and ensure the detection of subtle bullying? Um, previous research uh, and sort of in the field of also human computer interaction um, has experimented also with, uh, with bystander involvement. So what is, what is the, the right way to engage with bystanders? So those who can become upstanders or who can on the other hand support the perpetrator. Um, there was quite a lot of work with reflective messages, uh, meaning for instance, interfaces that would, um, uh, when uh, uh, a potentially abusive content is about to be posted by someone, uh, the system scans for it, and then it prompts the person not to post it. It nudges them in a certain direction or gives them uh, a certain amount of time to reflect whether they actually want to post this content or not. Um, also, uh, one of the standard sort of pieces of advice is that the school should be involved, if appropriate, uh, in the resolution of a case. And reporting to school is, is typically highly, or to teachers, it's typically highly encouraged in addition to reporting cyberbullying when it happens to parents and guardians, which children do not necessarily want to do, always do not feel comfortable because they're not sure that these will be able to provide them with adequate support. Um, so we wanted to see if AI detects bullying, what is the best way to actually get the school involved and how do teens feel about that? Um, and sort of uh, at this, we also wanted to see how do they feel about just the very effectiveness of takedown because so much focus in the policy area, both with industry and with, uh, uh, or with, with the legislation that's been developed around this has been around really content takedown. So the idea is if you just get the platform to take the content down, you solve a large part of the problem, but is it really the case? And how effective is content takedown per se if you don't develop uh, an ecosystem of support for the child afterwards? So the, our goal was really to solicit children's feedback um, on all of this. Um, and so, as I said, we did qualitative research uh, with children aged 12 to 17, four focus groups with teen girls, two focus groups with teen boys. Some of this was done on Zoom because of COVID, which made things more difficult. Um, and we had 15 individual in-depth interviews on Zoom, and this was all done in June and July, 2021. Uh, and so we designed, I just have to go through this briefly as I'm running out of time, but we designed uh, in a program called Figma, we designed demos for them, uh, where we uh, uh, portrayed hypothetical interventions that could still be possible based on uh, what AI technology, I just broadly, roughly, very crudely call it AI technology, but what uh, all of this technology is able to detect at the moment. Um, so different types of exclusion. Um, and I thought that the best thing for me to do was to play this video, which was uh, uh, for you, which was uh, uh, created for uh, Anti-Bullying Center's uh, uh, teaching module on social media youth well-being, which details what kinds of interventions we've shown to children. And this module was developed so that um, we could explain in a child-friendly, and this, uh, sorry, this, uh, this animation was developed so that we can um, explain to children in a very friendly manner um, uh, what some of these interventions could look like. So I, I will just uh, play this video for you now. What if there was a tool that could know when bullying happens to you or a friend on a social media or gaming site. 
And what if that tool could offer you the help that you need without you having to first report bullying content to the site? Think of a girl called Sally. Sally sets up an account on a social media platform. She's offered a choice of adding helpers. Helpers are friends who can be contacted if Sally gets bullied on the site. Sally chooses Zach as her helper. A few days later, Sally gets some mean comments in her post. A tool, which is based on artificial intelligence or AI, discovers these comments. The tool can then alert Zach that Sally needs support or suggest to Zach that he could reach out to people who posted mean comments and ask them to take them down or to report these mean comments to the site. Normally, when you see or experience something that you think is bullying or harassment on a site, you can report it to the site. This way, you let the site know that you do not think that such content is okay. The site then looks into your reported content and decides if the content should be taken down. The site will only take the content down if it is against the law or if it violates something called the site's policy. This is like a document with rules on what is allowed and what is not allowed at the site. Bullying, abuse, or harassment are typically not allowed. Or imagine if one day Anne does not invite Sally to her birthday party on purpose. Anne wants to make Sally feel excluded. Then Anne and a few friends, Rosian and Claire, post a photo of themselves from the birthday party on social media. They tag Sally in it, even though Sally was not there. They do that just to show Sally that she's out. The photo gets reposted across many sites, along with some mean comments. Imagine now if AI could discover this photo before it is posted over and over, and alert Zach that this is happening, and suggest that Zach could report the photo to the site if he thinks it is abusive, or ask Sally to check if the photo is abusive and report it to the site. The site could then help stop the photo and mean comments from being shared to other sites. The idea is that AI could work in the background and figure out when some mean content is posted on the site. The AI could alert the site that this is potentially bullying or suggest ways to users as to how to help each other. Social media and gaming sites already have the power to recognize some of these cases. They can do that before you, as a user, report anything to them. Yeah, so we, this is essentially, these are hypothetical cases um, or hypothetical interventions that are not yet implemented on the platforms and they might never be, but we solicited that they, they're possible based on what the technology can do. And so we solicited teams feedback on this. Um, and so just briefly, I'm out of time, but uh, with preliminary findings, there were really mixed views. These are just preliminary. We still haven't analyzed um, uh, the, uh, uh, the qualitative, uh, the, the interviews and the focus groups. So we're just, uh, uh, please bear with me. But um, uh, essentially there were mixed views about uh, uh, this, um, uh, about really, the, the whole idea of something working in the background on their content and scanning it. So interestingly enough, uh, generally they didn't really mind AI working in the background if it will help with cyberbullying. Uh, even in direct messaging, there were, there were some who expressed concern and actually they just wanted to make sure they, they're actively opting in um, for such an uh, intervention. Um, for this idea of having a helper, Zach, as a helper, they, they welcomed it in general, but they really expressed doubt that some sites would ever implement such a thing. Um, and uh, they also had very mixed views on, on uh, sort of to what extent bystanders should be involved. Um, and we had different degrees of friendship in terms of how close a, a friend is, or is it just someone who viewed the abusive content, but it's not necessarily a friend. So some teams were really and preteens were, were really concerned about involving too many people and they just wanted to keep it more private. Um, and uh, for instance, for uh, the exclusion scenario, we used uh, facial recognition. So AI would figure out based on facial recognition that more people are tagged in the photo that are, than are actually present. And um, when we told them that AI could do that, uh, they were quite a few of them sort of found that spooky, uh, that uh, the facial recognition would sort of could, would be able to be leveraged for that purpose. Um, 
And uh, they agreed that social media should have a relationship with the school so that the school should be able to ex uh, escalate a case and that AI could be used in a, in a way to actually optimize that process. But some were skept skeptical as to how much the school can help and in which context. But um, I'm not able to go into that right now. But that's the um, sort of those are the, the, the preliminary things that we did, which we will detail in, um, in the papers um, that come out of this. Um, so thank you. Um, thanks so much. And uh, I'm uh, happy to answer any uh, questions via email or in whichever way this will uh, work. Thanks so much.